Decor. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Universal Dialect Show. I'm your host, Chris Cypher 73 Cabrera, and I have a fantastic guest. This is show number six. Uh, I've been trying to get this guy for a couple of months, but he's in demand. Uh, and there's a reason. He's got a lot of fucking knowledge, man. Uh, I want to introduce to you today, Esoteric Eddie. What's up, my brother? What up, what up? Thank you for having me. Not yeah, man. Stay. I'm going to stay, my man. Um, so, like I said, I, I was, we were talking before I pressed record. Um, I, I saw you on a couple of shows, uh, primarily the Tinfoil Hat show, and you were dropping like mega fucking bombs. And a lot of questions that I had, particularly about religion, because I, I don't consider myself a religious person. You were like really like hitting on all those notes. Um, and it's a very sensitive topic, but I'm not a person to shy away. And I don't believe you are either to tell the truth. Right. There's like truth out there and people are following things that really they shouldn't follow or maybe they're not going down the right path. So um, give me first the origin of Esoteric Eddie. Like, where are you originally from? Like, have you always lived in this area? Have you moved around? Because usually that, you know, inspires you if you live in different areas. And then how did you become Esoteric Eddie? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I'm originally from North County, San Diego, California, uh, born and raised there. And I lived there pretty much my whole up to 25 years old. And then at 25 years old, which was about three years ago for me now, I moved to Northern California in the Bay Area, about an hour above San Francisco in a place called Santa Rosa. It's, a, it's pretty much the last biggest city in California before it starts getting more and more, uh, you know, country. So I lived up there for, for a year from 2020 to 2021. And um, the reason I moved, I'm a plumber. I've been plumbing for four, four years now. And I decided I was going through a lot at that time in my life. And I decided, you know what, let me just dip. You know, I, I, there was really no reason for me to stay in Southern California. So I left went to go pursue my own thing and, and started a new journey up there. And it was a fantastic experience. And then I was there for about a year. And then I came back to SoCal um, for, you know, personal reasons and uh, been down here in SoCal for, for a year. And uh, now I'm looking at moving out of California altogether, but uh, all throughout my life, I've kind of, I've, my life has revolved around the esoteric I grew up in a religious family, both a Christian and Catholic, and I had certain experiences growing up as a kid that kind of led me on this path. Like, for example, I've always been a writer and I've always loved writing and it started off with fiction. Um, but when I was in elementary school, one of the earliest experiences that I had was reading this book that had to do with like uh, dragons. And I was reading this book about dragons or whatever, but in in that book there was a part where they talked about knights and how knights used to fight dragons or whatever you know it's a children's book but it was pretty profound for a children's book there was a part in the book where they started talking about the holy grail and how knights used to try to look for the holy grail this this, and that and i remember looking there was an illustration that like stayed in my mind forever and it was it was just like a cave full of treasure. And in the middle of the treasure was like this, this holy grail, which you would imagine like a, a golden cup kind of just sitting there shining a little bit. So I'm reading this like probably in uh, first grade. And so that kind of was like one of the first things that stuck in the, my subconscious, you know, the holy grail and knights, which of course now we know is, you know, the Knights Templar and the Merovingian bloodline or the Ark of the Covenant. You know, it's uh, there's a lot of debates on what it could be. And then a couple other experiences that I had growing up, um, there's a lot, you know, but I'm kind of just going over a few brief ones. But another one was my grandpa, you know, who was a pastor um, before I was born. And then he, has, he also went through his own, you know, trials and tribulations with alcoholism and gambling and whatnot. So he kind of left the church. But when, when I was about eight years old, you know, he told me that he had seen a UFO before. My grandpa's always kind of been like a distant you know, introvert guy, just kind of smoking cigarettes off to the distance. And when I was about eight, I asked him, you know, like, hey, man, like, why are you always just chilling, looking at the sky? And uh, come to find out, it's because he had seen a UFO and he was kind of always just looking up at the stars, hoping to see another one. And at eight years old, that kind of like shook me because I grew up in a religious family. So I asked him, you know, and I knew that he had been a pastor. So I asked him, you know, well, what is that? How does that make you feel about God? And he kind of just 
took a drag, you know, looked at me and said, I don't know. <laughs> you know, and that blew my mind as at eight years old. So at that point, I knew like, okay, there's more to this life. You know, there's more to religion. There's more to the Bible. And I uh, kept growing up. And, and of course, um, I got into psychedelics, got into cannabis, got into underground hip hop from like 12 to 14 years old. And that stuff really, really started to open my mind up. And right around that same time, I started to hit the books, started reading a lot of, uh, you know, Zechariah Sitchin, David Icke, Bob Frisell, a few other uh, authors I can't remember, um, but started reading that stuff, watching documentaries, get into, into Alex Jones. And then this stuff just really blew my lid, man. You know, now I'm just like making all these different connections and life has started to make sense to me. Now I can see why there's all this weirdness and all these ancient archaic things that are still around us. Um, and so all throughout high school, I, you know, I started to, to develop, started to develop you know, artistic skills in music, in writing, in graphic design, and also videography, you know, that's just start, I, I've always been artistic, but these things started to develop in high school. And then after high school, I, I, I attempted to take my skills and, and uh, influence the world um, with the passions that I had. So I went through various incarnations as an artist. For, for an example, when I was in high school, I started a, a little brand a little brand um, by the name of Kill Gov. It was, I used to be more like political in my work. Now I focus more on historical stuff, esoteric stuff, the occult, but I used to be more politically, politically driven. So this little brand I had was called Kill Gov, short for Kill Government. I was all into, you know, the conspiracies, you know, we got to take down the government. And it was popping, you know, I had my peers rocking the beanies, rocking the t-shirts of the graphics I was making. And that was accompanied with the hip hop that I was making as well. Excuse me. I was making hip hop at that time, which was also politically driven. What was the name of your group? Do you, can you tell at us? that time, uh, it was Mentally High. Okay. Okay. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, it was me and two other homies and well, two other rapper homies and then another uh, producer homie. I would make beats and then our other homie, Jimmy, would also make beats. Um, it was fun, man. It was a, a wonderful time, man. We... We'd pack the car and we'd go drive up to L.A. and go play shows out there, backyard shows or like actual um, opening shows up for like actual headliners and stuff. Any but material? Like, any like it, demos or do you have any like CDs? Oh, yeah. There's all there's all kinds of music laying around the Internet and stuff like that. Yeah. But nothing I really want to share, to be honest. <laughs> I got you. you. Know? Yeah. I mean, I, I have songs that are cool. I mean, I still make music to this day. I just, uh, if you follow me on Instagram, Esoteric Eddie, I just, so every now and then I'll, I'll leak a little bit, you know, some stuff that I'm working on at the house just for fun. Like right. I just dropped something the other day. Uh, side note, like I'm, I'm working on a documentary that I'm going to drop this week, this weekend on ancient Tibet and the occult. Oh, awesome. And upon, upon my research, you know, I mean, I have a hip hop mind, dude. So like when I'm researching like 70s documentaries and I hear cool little jingles in the background and all I I'm thinking you. is like, man, sample. I could sample this right sample. now. <laughs> and that's exactly what I did. I sampled this little Tibet documentary, threw some drums over it, threw some lyrics over it, and I made a little video. It's, it's on my Instagram. But uh, yeah, so I've gone through incarnations, you know, as an artist. It was mostly politically and hip hop driven from basically high school up until my early 20s. And I had different YouTube channels that were still a part of that sphere, but I wasn't really finding real success. And so I kind of just started to uh, leave all of that behind. I started to retire from hip hop because it was all rooted in like my younger self, my high school self. And I started to feel less attached, you know, to my high school self. I started to grow as a person, as a young man. So I retired from all that. And, I, and on top of that, I was going through a lot of personal things with my friends and with the industry and with the local scene and just everything. So I left it all behind. And right around the age of 25, when I left Southern, South, Southern California altogether, I started to revamp and redesign what I wanted to do with myself and my skills and who I wanted to be known as. And I wanted to be more authentic to who I am as a person, um, you know, because I don't really like to drive with ego. I mean, we all have a bit of ego, but I, I, hip hop is a, it's an ego sport. It is. So I wanted to lead with less ego and more just wanted to let my work speak for itself. So I, I set out to write a book, a second book, actually, because I wrote my first book in 2018, which was still kind of tied to my political and hip hop self. But I wrote my second book 
you know, from the age of 25. And, and I just released it last December at the age of 27. And when I dropped that book, I came with a new Instagram and a new YouTube channel. And, and so my, my current brand or my current artist incarnation is Esoteric Eddie. So everything I drop online is under Esoteric Eddie. But my book, my, my newest book, The Lucifer Mystery Revealed, is uh, published under my, my real name, you know, Eduardo Fidencio Cano or Eduardo Fidencio Cano, however you'd like to pronounce it. <laughs> Cano, man. Cano, let's it, keep it real, bro. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's Cano. <laughs> I just say Cano because that, that's how the homies know me out here, I got you. you know. But um, yeah, man, so going through all of that up to the age of 25, you know, briefly um, going over all of that, I just decided to, to scrap everything and, and, and become – just esoteric Eddie, you know, I just, I just wanted to be Eddie, but I knew I had to throw something in front of that, you know, to make it more marketable. So here I am at the age of 28, I've got my new book pop on and popping. It's been good. That's awesome. uh, I've, I've been featured on like close to 30 <clears throat> podcasts now within this short span of six months or less than six months. The YouTube page is on and popping as well. Just a lot of documentaries and a lot of love on there. So I'm just keeping this current incarnation going. Good, my brother. Good. All right. So now that you gave us like a little intro, which I appreciate, um, I'm going to tell you, like, like I told you initially, the, the stuff about religion is really what got me. I mean, I know you know stuff about UFOs as well because of your grandfather and stuff, but um, and it ties into religion as well. We'll get to that point. But uh, just to give you an idea, like I grew up in a Roman Catholic you know, household, so I'm, I'm going to be 50 next year. So growing up in New York City, I grew up Roman Catholic. And even going to church, I always knew there was something not right. Like even even though I didn't want to be there, like most kids, they they don't want to be at church. They want to be at home playing or doing whatever. Even when I was out, even when I was at church, I was still listening to what the sayings were and the messages and the lessons and all that. But something just didn't connect with me, and and it wasn't because of laziness. It was because I I knew something wasn't right. Like, okay, why am I showing up to this place with all these people that I don't know? And we don't know their backgrounds. We don't know who they really are. And years later, you find out that in that, th that same room, the same church, there's rapists in that place. There's pedophiles and criminals and, you know, people that are just really bad, along with people that just want to get their life together. But um, as I got older, my mother being a single mother, she didn't like Christianity because she felt like it was using her. I don't know why she felt that way, but that's how she felt. So she tried a different religions. Now that's where like my, I don't want to say expertise, but my experience comes in because I'm not speaking in terms of just Christianity. I'm speaking of terms of my mother going to Baptist church and essentially sitting there and hearing them say the exact same things the Christians were saying, but you know, they would talk shit about each other. So I'm like, okay, you're talking about the same things, but you're talking shit about each other and you want the same things, but you're talking shit about each other. Then going to Protestant, same thing. Then my mother decided, okay, she wasn't going to follow any religion, but believe in, let's say God or a higher power, like most people say. But then she wanted me and my brother, because I have a younger brother, to still follow some sort of, you know, spirituality. So she set us up with these Jehovah's Witness. Now that's a clusterfuck in of itself. So I'm with these Jehovah's Witness. They're nice people, but again, preaching the same exact shit that the Protestants, the Baptists, and the Christians are preaching. So again, granted, I don't want to be around these people, and I'd rather be doing my own thing, but I'm still listening. I'm still picking up on lessons, and I'm still realizing, bro, this is like all bullshit. Like, like this doesn't make any sense. Like you got all these people that have these certain things that, that, that separate each other, but they're all preaching the same thing. They have so-called the same messages, but they hate on each other. Then throughout the years, I realized that Christianity in of itself hates pagans, but they stole a lot of things from the pagan religion. So how does that make sense? And then you ask uh, uh, priests and pastors, they can't give you answers. And it's like, dude, if God gave you this power, supposedly to be able to answer these questions, you can't answer me, then why should I trust you and believe you? So let's get into that, bro. Let's get into like what created specifically esoteric eddie what did you see and what path did it lead you down yeah damn well, sorry man. <laughs> no I, I, it's all good i just i just i'm a deep person so like go for ex it excuse me if i just like kind of go, go on or on you know but uh about you I mean, my man <laughs> yeah i mean honestly like I, i'm being honest when i say like my whole entire life has revolved around this stuff 
like like how I mentioned earlier, like I still vividly remember reading that that book on dragons and knights in first grade. And so it's like almost like something, you know, not to get spiritual, but it's almost like something has been guiding me this whole entire time. And uh, like another another important par uh, part of my life or event in my life that kind of led me on this, that I think spiritually speaking, was uh, my mom. She, she handed me a Bible when I was like nine or 10 or something. And she said, you know, she told me the story about King Solomon, you know, and how King Solomon you know, he, he, all he asked God for was wisdom. And so because that's all he asked for humbly, God blessed him with all these riches and all these other things. And uh, so she told me that story and she gave me the Bible and she said, when you pray to God, just pray to understand the Bible. He's like, just, just pray to him for understanding, for wisdom, for knowledge. And I thought that was cool. I thought that was a cool story as a kid, like, damn, that's what's up. Like, you know, come to God humbly and, and he'll, he'll bless you in many other ways. So I actually took that serious as a kid. And I, and I, whatever you think God is, the creator, that universal force, you know, uh, manifestation and stuff. I, I prayed wholeheartedly as a kid. And I just said, you know what, like, forget everything else. I just want knowledge. I just want wisdom. I just want to understand what's really going on out here. And I attribute that moment spiritually to what the rest of my life has really been. I mean, ever since then, I've just been on this escapade, man. Just this knowledge is just unfolds in front of me left and right. But uh, so it's been a lot of different things. For another story, for example, I, the first Freemason that I ever met was in middle school. And he was an on-site substitute teacher. Everybody loved him. All the kids loved him because he was just cool. He was laid back. He was an Irish guy. He was Mr. McCreary also known as Mr. Roberts. The kids loved him because he let us be our own people. Like he was never on us or like, you know, like he, he, he let us cut curse also. He's that's what we, why we liked him. He let us say like crap and you know, other, other curse words. And stuff. He was cool. He was laid back, you know, he was mystical and he was, he was rich. He was always pulling up in these like super nice cars. But uh, when I was in Saturday school with me and another kid once, it was just me and this other kid. And we were in Saturday school with Mr. McCreary and we're just kicking back. And he just lets us do our own thing. And we start starts telling us stories. And he tells us a story about this, this fat ring that he had on his hand. You know, he was always had this big ass ring and come to find out, you know, it was a Freemason ring. And I didn't know what that was at the time. So he starts telling us about the Freemasons and how he got the ring from his from his priest or, or the head of the lodge back in Ireland. And and his priest took him to these dungeons and these lairs and showed him all these ancient like all this ancient stuff and like these skeletons that still reside in these lairs. And when his priest was dying, he gave, he gave him the ring and told him, if anybody tries to steal this from you, they will die. You know, being young, like that stuck in my mind, you know, like, oh, what? like there's, there's power to this ring. When I was young, I was always fascinated by like the treasure aspect of things, treasure, the powers, like the, that kind of stuff, you know, but, but the knowledge was always there subconsciously and, and it would lead me to these things later on in life. So it was just, man, I tell you, like my whole life has just been revolving around this stuff. But uh, like when, like in high school, when I got into all this stuff, I was the dude, man. I was a conspiracy theorist. I like, walk around my school, like, like warning everybody, like preaching this stuff, like, yo, like the end is near kind of guy. Like me and my friends, we used to like write different things on sticky notes, like research Planet X, research the Anunnaki and go stick them everywhere. Right. So it, it really wasn't like one main event. You know, I have, it's just my whole entire life has been event after event after event. It, but what really set me off to become Esoteric Eddie was, was me being 25 years old, you know, being a mature, you know, young man at that point, you know, and, and just going through so much. I mean, 25 years of life, you know, just everything you can think of, you know what I mean? Every aspect, love, death, you know, all these things we go through in life, just 25 years of it sitting there thinking like this, this ain't it like i'm not done my work the work is not done so i decided i'm going to hit the books i'm going to go harder than ever and and i did and i and i published my book and I, i've dropped a new youtube channel and i've just been dropping documentary after documentary because i knew and i still know the work has yet to be finished it's far from finished so what really set me off to be esoteric eddie what was that mindset at 25 years old knowing the work was not done and it needs to go on Right, right. 
So go ahead, my man. So let's let's get into like the, the religion, the religious aspect, because yeah. you wrote a book about Lucifer. And yeah, to yeah. me, it's like, man, like, let, let's get into that, man. Like yeah. Lucifer, everybody believes is like the evil guy. He's, he's Satan, Beelzebub. He's all these different names. But is he real? <laughs> OK, OK. Yeah, we'll get into it. So, yeah. So I grew up as a kid thinking that the devil was real, you know, right. just and it, it like it tormented me, man. Honestly, like I used to think that that he was real, that demons were real, and not to say that they're not. It's just I have a different perspective on them now, which I can get into right. after. But uh, so so coming up from that mind state, I I always knew that part of my work was going to be um, demystifying and deconstructing, you know, the religious dogma that holds such a bind on our people's right. minds. That's a part of my work, my, you know, is, is, is to do that, to free us, so, you know, but uh, so, all right, we'll get into Lucifer. So my book is about Lucifer. It's, I explain it as being an academic perspective on the historicity of Lucifer within the church and the occult. And when I set out to write it, I kind of already knew who Lucifer was, but uh, I didn't know that I was going to learn so much more about the subject, which is, which fascinated me. Right. So we all learned about Lucifer from the famous verse in Isaiah 14, 12. And it's the famous, Oh, Lucifer, how art thou fallen, et cetera, et cetera. And what I came to find was that Lucifer in the English version, the King's James version is only right. mentioned once. And it's mentioned in that famous Isaiah 14, 12 verse. Wow. And yeah. And Lucifer was concocted uh, through these misinterpreted viewpoints that came from reading that. And I'll explain that. So from the English, we had, uh, we, well, we got the English um, from the Latin, which was translated from the Greek, which was translated right. from the Hebrew. Now, Lucifer is used once in the English version as an uppercase word or pronoun as a name. But in the original Hebrew, of course, we're not going to see Lucifer. What we see in Hebrew is Hillel ben Shahar. Oh, okay. yeah. Now, now this is going to take some unpacking here. So, um, and what language is that? That's because, Hebrew. Okay, so it's in Hebrew. So, all right. So the Bible initially was written in Hebrew, quote unquote, quote unquote. Yes, yes. So, so when we say the Bible, right? We, we, you know, I guess you can say Westerners, right? Everybody right. in the Americas and in Europe. Uh, we, we think of the Bible as, as the Old and the New Testament, but that's kind of like an a incorrect way of viewing it. You know, the, the Bible is actually a culmination of, of various books, and it's actually meshing two different religions together. The, the Old Testament is, belongs to Judaism, and it's, not, it's known to, to them as the, 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 uh, the Torah or the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Torah, which were apparently uh, or allegedly written by Moses. And then the New Testament, which is what Christianity is based off of, you know, the, the Gospels of yes. the Apostles, that's the New Testament. So those together is the Bible, right? So the Old Testament was written in Hebrew by the, the original Jews. And then the New Testament was actually mostly written in, in Greek, in Coptic Greek, and some of it in Aramaic. Okay, so, and um, the Isaiah verse where we get Lucifer from comes from the Old Testament, which was written in Hebrew. So, and Isaiah, for those who don't know, he was a prophet and a scribe, a royal one at, at that, not just some random dude. He was a royal prophet and scribe who worked hand in hand with the Hebrew kings. And there, I, I write a little bit about him in the book, and there are some archaeological evidence pointing to him being a real character, a real person. Okay. Um, so, so instead of Lucifer in the original Hebrew verse, we see Halal ben Shahar. And what that's referring to is actually an old Canaanite deity because Hebrew or sorry, Judaism actually spawned from the old world religions of Canaan or the Canaanite religions or, or um, yeah, Canaan and just that whole old world, like Phoenician uh, religions and civilizations and even further back to Sumer, which I also get into the book. Um, 
So Hillel Ben Shahar, what it actually means, Hillel is a name and it means bright or shiny. So it's like naming your kid bright. Right. And then Ben in Hebrew means son. So Hillel Ben Shahar would mean Hillel, son of Shahar. Shahar was the name of an old Canaanite deity. And Shahar means dawn, you know, like the morning, dawn. So that's where we got Lucifer, son of the morning, Hillel Ben Shahar. And uh, so from the, uh, the Hebrew it, it, to the Greek, it was properly translated because in the Greek, instead of Hillel Ben Shahar, we see that we see the word phosphorus, phosphorus, which means also bright or can mean fire. But in the Greek, it was properly translated, um, was somewhat properly translated as, as a lowercase word, right? As, a, as an adjective. And then in the Latin, it was also properly translated as an adjective with the word Lucifer, because Lucifer is a Latin word. So it's properly translated as Lucifer, but as a lowercase word. And it's actually used several times throughout the Latin um, Vulgate, which is the Latin uh, translated Bible. And all those words, Lucifer in the Latin, Phosphorus in the Greek, Hillel in the Hebrew, can all mean bright or shiny. And, um, and then we get the Lucifer in the English, where it is improperly translated as an uppercase, turning it into a, a, a name, into right. a character name known as Lucifer. Right. But it gets very complex because originally it was referring to a deity, but it was referring to an old Canaanite deity who was known as Hillel, but also known as Athtar. <clears throat> so listen, let me ask you a question. So you got Lucifer being lowercase, which really stands for as a, a name for something not a person per se, right? And yeah, then all yeah. of a sudden it starts appearing with the capital L, which gives it gives a significance and attachment to it being a person or name of a person or a thing. Was that done on purpose? Like, is that something that somebody decided who now we could, we could play around with this and fuck with people's minds. And now instead of it being a thing or it representing something that happens, like, you know, you said the dawn that happens, meaning light, you know, it goes from dark to light. So you got brightness, like you said, or phosphorus. Phosphorus is flammable. No fire. You know, let's fuck around and let's turn it into something and, and start driving people in a certain direction. I'll get into that in a second. OK, go ahead. Um, so just to wrap up the Hillel thing, because that, that's a complex thing that many scholars have <laughs> taken a look at. And so the thing about Isaiah, right, Isaiah, when Isaiah was writing this, he was writing this towards the end of um, the current Judaic kingdom. He was writing this when the Babylonians were beginning to descend on the kingdom of Judea and take them captive, what is known in the famous, as the famous Babylonian captivity. So Isaiah was writing this right around that time, prophesizing the fall of the Babylonians. But okay, so, but uh, Isaiah was, was smart. You know, he was educated, so he knew about the old religions and the old mythologies that Judaism was based on. And so Hillel ben Shahar, as I mentioned, refers to an old Canaanite deity in an old Canaanite tale. And we know this because we uncovered a lot of these Canaanite tales in the 1930s and, and what are known as the Baal cycle texts. And in those texts, we find Hillel and Shahar in those texts. Hillel is not known as... Uh, Hillel in those texts, but he's known as Athtar. And Athtar um, was actually a male rendition of the earlier Astarte or Ashtar or Ishtar or Sumerian Inanna. And all of those goddesses and Athtar and Hillel um, are also, th those names can also be used in, in Hebrew and in Canaanite to represent Venus. And as we know, Venus in its celestial mythology is the brightest object in the morning sky preceding the sun, even in astronomy. And you could take a telescope, depending on where you are in the world, Venus is the brightest celestial object in the sky preceding the sun, preceding right. the dawn. Yeah, sometimes you don't even need a telescope. Yeah, you can see it with your <laughs> naked eye. So what Isaiah was doing, if you actually read Isaiah 14, 12, he's not talking about a Lucifer or a Satan or a demon or anything. He's actually prophesizing and condemning the downfall of these Babylonian 
um, you know, enslavers. And he's using this metaphorical language saying that these Babylonian kings are like Hillel or like Astar, who think that they're they're bright, you know, like Venus. They think that they're bright and shiny and they're powerful, but they will soon be overpowered by the sun or God or Yahweh. So it's all metaphorical language playing on old Canaanite tales and the symbology of Venus and stuff like that. And so it was properly translated through the Greek and the Latin and then improperly translated into English. Now, to answer your question, was that done deliberately? Now, that's something I speculate in the book, and we haven't been able to trace any evidence that it was done deliberately, but there, but there is a very interesting story about how that came to be. Um, so the person who translated the Greek into the Latin, the person who translate, who created the Latin Vulgate, the Latin version of the Bible, is known as Hier Hieronymus, Hieronym sorry, Eusebius Hieronymus. These ancient names, man. It's all tongue twisters. Well, you know Hieronymus Bosch? Yeah. That's the artist. I mean, that's how I know about the name Hieronymus. I, I know that name through him. And he yeah, was, guess you know next level artist so but anyway go ahead i'm sorry yeah that dude's a true. <clears throat> yeah that, i guess that was a common name that's pretty cool <laughs> and we should bring it back <laughs> eusebius hieronymus but he's more uh famously known as jerome in the church he's known as father jerome he's the one who created the latin vulgate and he was commissioned to do so by the constantinian dynasty so this is right around the fourth century you know the 300s king constantine era. and all that yeah yeah. So he was commissioned to do this by, by uh, the Constantinian you know, kingdom. And uh, but what's important is during his time, during the Constantinian era, there was a schism that was being played out between the church. And basically there was there was a band or a group of, of uh, church clergymen who were trying to push forward this doctrine known as the um, the Arian doctrine. And the Arian doctrine stated that Christ was a title that, be, that could be given to any man through God. So basically demoting Jesus as just like a spiritual savior who was given the title Christ. But, you know, he was just a regular man, you know, who was kind of given that title, given that responsibility. So therefore, any other man could be given that title and that responsibility as well. And therefore, at that time, it would have been Constantine who would have been given that title, Christ, Christ. on earth. Right. That's the Arian doctrine during that time. Now, let me ask you a question, just to cut, because the, again, yeah. like growing up, Jesus Christ in churches, most of them, this surfer looking dude with blonde hair, you know, blue eyes, whatever, but then I found out that he might have been modeled after Cesar Borgia, yeah. who was, I believe, the son of Constantine, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but like. You telling me that the Christ that we all that most people, you know, pray to or whatever is not even really a person. It's more a title of someone that takes over as being, you know, in charge of that, let's say that whole the whole doctrine, so to speak. Like am yeah. I on point or am I off or anything along those lines? Just correct me if you if you will, because that's what I what what I researched. That's what I found. I found like that this Jesus Christ might not even be real because he, his picture is basically a model essentially that they used to to as an image. You know? Yeah. Uh, just looked up real quick. Not the son of Constantine, but uh, I guess it says online Ill illegitimate son of uh, Pope Alexander. Um, VI, I don't know my Roman numerals. Neither do I. <laughs> it's everyone that is, yeah. whenever I'm reading it, like in my heaven. head, I just, I always just say Pope Alexander, whatever the fuck. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. Whenever I'm reading it in my mind. Right. Um, but I mean, yeah, there's a lot of evidence to speculate that. I mean, of course, Jesus wasn't blonde and blue eyes. That's for damn sure. You know, um, anytime I walk into a church and I see that, I'm like, oh, yeah, there's some bullshit going on in here. You know, but but no. So the Arian doctrine was certainly, but yeah, basically trying to justify, you know, Constantine as being Christ. But what I'm getting to um, with the whole Lucifer thing, which that's interesting. Whereas was this deliberately put in there? This word was that the people, the priests, and the clergymen that were opposing the Arian doctrine were actually these this band of the clergymen who were headed by um, this dude by the name of Saint Lucifer. Wow. So there was there was an actual priest back then, a bishop, 
um, by the name of Saint Lucifer, because again, Lucifer is just um, an Italian word or a Latin word for light, you know, or right. bright. So uh, that was his real name, and and he was fiercely opposing this Arian doctrine, him and a couple other people. And so he was for the church. He was for Jesus saying, no, like Jesus is the Christ. He's the only one that can be Christ. And so he was exiled. And, and while he was exiled, he, he wrote some heated letters to Constantine and his, his, his kids, you know, pretty much is just, just beefing with them, you know, um, sending some diss letters. And mm. uh, but so and his followers were known as the Luciferians. Not the Luciferians as we know them today, but but it's funny they were the Luciferians then were actually for Jesus Christ, right, right. You know, so that's where uh, the head fuck comes in. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and and this is all going down. Constantine dies. His kids eventually, you know, lose power, and then there's new there's new kingdoms, and then uh, the new the emperor after the Constantinian dynasty. I forget his name. He was sympathetic towards the Luciferians, and so he allows them to come back. But this time, there's a new debate going on, and Lucifer is debating. Saint Lucifer is debating all the bishops that converted to Arianism, saying that if any person you know converted to Arianism, they're okay to be accepted and, and forgiven. But any any bishop who willingly converted to Arianism should be dis, you know excommunicated. So they're having these public discourses, these public debates, because that was huge back in the day, right? Having public discourse and debates. And um, these Arians end up using St. Lucifer's logic against him and saying, well, if Christ is the only one that can rule, then he's the only one that can forgive. So therefore, you have no place to tell us whether or not we can be forgiven. So all in all, St. Lucifer kind of loses the debates and is just kind of remembered as this disheveled, bitter bishop. And But what's important is the person who was witnessing all of this was St. Jerome. And he actually has a book that he left behind where he, he um, chronicles the dialogues of these debates known as um, the Dialogue Against the Luciferians. So St. Jerome was witnessing all of this. And he's the one who wrote the Latin Vulgate, which where we first saw the word Lucifer used in the Bible. So there is some speculation that even St. Jerome threw another metaphor on top of Isaiah's metaphors of Hillel and Venus with the word Lucifer, saying that, you know, you think you're like Lucifer, you can go up against, you know, uh, the powers that be, which at that time was the Constantinian dynasty, but, uh, you know, you can't. You end up losing, yeah. Yeah. So th that's really the only <coughs> thing we see as far as the Latin Vulgate, but everything after that, once we start getting into the New Testament and the early Christian church and the early Christian fathers, um, from my honest opinion at this point, I think it was just misunderstanding. You know, they were looking at it and they didn't really understand what they were reading. For example, I, I kind of chronicle that in the book. And the, one of the first people we see mentioned Lucifer in the, within the early Christian church was, was Oregon Adamantius. Oregon Adamantius was in the second century common era. So in the 100s, the late 100s, um, which is right, right there, you know, right at the hub of the start of Christianity. And um, he's one of the first people to mention Lucifer in his book known as De Principis. And he kind of, he's reading Isaiah, you know, probably, you know, in Greek or Latin. Right. And he sees Lucifer, well, probably Latin, right? Because he sees Lucifer, the word Lucifer. And he's, he kind of freaks out. He has like a psychedelic trip and starts realizing like, oh, man, like there's this whole other power named Lucifer. Like, what is this stuff? So so from Oregon Adamantius and onwards, it just took hold. It's just one of those things that just took hold of people. And because uh, we, we love that stuff. You know, we love drama. We love villains. We love that kind of stuff. And here we are today. With a with a TV show named Lucifer, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's crazy. All right, so you mentioned like Arians, right? And when you say Arians, the way that you talk about it, it's just a, a group of people, whatever. But if you look at history or the history they teach us, it, Aryan race leads to the Nazis. So, yeah. so we're being again lied to again. Like that, that 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 connection is is essentially a lie. Is there any way you can get into that? Like, why, why, why are Aryans considered like negative people? Like, why? How, what connects them to the Nazis per se? You know what I mean? Sure, sure. Yeah, this is actually uh, 
perfect because I'm actually working on like a documentary on Tibet and also looking at like some of the Indo-European stuff or I have been lately. But when I'm talking about the Aryan doctrine, the thing that we just went over, yeah, that's totally different than the Aryan that we're about to talk about. The Aryan that we're talking about is A-R-Y-A-N. Excuse me. The Aryan that I just went over is A-R-I-A-N. And the Aryan doctrine from the fourth century, was, was it's called the Aryan doctrine because it was started by um, a dude named Arius. So it was named after Arius, the Aryan doctrine. So totally right. different, totally <clears throat> different, but just coincidentally, you know, lines up with Constantine and the Romans. So it kind of has that weird etymology that can kind of be connected. Right. But the Aryans, this is the interesting thing about the Aryans and the Nazis. Um, that I, I so I didn't know this until recently because I'm doing all this research for for new documentaries I'm going to put out. There's a debate that's been going on for a long time, almost a couple hundred years, about what's known as the Aryan invasion theory. And there's a theory, mostly in Western scholarship, that there was a band of of white Indo-Europeans that invaded the Indian continent. Um, sometime in like 1500 BC, if I'm correct. And it was these white Aryans that invaded India around around 1500 BC. These that gave it its early cu- culture. Uh, and there's, there's been, it's a huge debate that's still ongoing within, within academia and each side claims that they've ended the debate. So the Western scholarship says, oh, we have these archaeological evidences, these genetic evidences for the the Aryan invasion theory. And then the Indian scholarship says, like, it's all BS. It was all, you know, um, white imperialist doctrine and dogma to begin with. There is no genetic evidence for it at all. But where it all comes from um, is actually the Sanskrit Vedas. So the Vedas are the holy books of of Hinduism and, and pretty much the, the Bhagavadas and all that, the Bhagavadas and all that. Bhagavadas yeah. came came later. Those were additions. The Vedas are like there's <laughs> four of them, I believe. There's four Vedas that that are dated to around 1400, um, but then like the Bhagavad Gita and all that stuff, I believe, came later. There were additions, but the the word Aryan comes from the Vedas, and it's it's only you. It's another one of these things like the word Lucifer. It's like briefly mentioned in the Vedas, right. and it and the Aryans re- refers to these these group of people known as the noble ones. So I guess Aryan or Arya, it means like noble. So in the Vedas, when you're reading it, it's it's not referring to, according to the Indian scholarship, it's not referring to an actual ethnic group of people. It's referring to an ideological group of people. You know, it's like saying like, like scientists. It's like reading the word scientists and thinking that it's referring to an ethnic group of people. It's not area or the Aryans was a certain was a certain ideological group of people who viewed themselves as that as noble people, and I, apparently there is there is some connection with them in the Vedas as maybe being more fair skinned or having, you know, a lighter skinned lighter toned hair. I I don't know. I haven't got that far into the research yet, but um, so and so in the early nineteen or the mid nineteen hundreds, like nineteen thirty and onward, there's this huge influx of Western scholarship, just scourging, you know, India and and just that whole area like Central Asia, Tibet, um, like Siberia, Crimea, just what's known as like the Indo-European area. And they were scourging that area, trying to find the origins for white people, for their people, for their Germanic race and all that stuff. Because what's what's strange, what we realized late, like uh, in the late 1800s, um, is that all like European languages, like German, Italian, Latin, English, all of those languages actually derive from Sanskrit. That's a secret they don't want you to know. It's like all European languages we realize in the 1800s derives from Sanskrit. Sanskrit is is apparently seemingly the mother the mother uh, of all language languages right? of European languages. <clears throat> So the, the Europeans didn't like that. You know, they didn't like that. So they had to go on this quest to try to, to reverse it and say that the Aryans, these, these white Indo-Europeans who um, supposedly came from the Iran area, right? Because Aryan could be etymolog- etymologically tied to Iran. Um, so 
So basically, there's this huge debate going on in, in scholarship saying that these Aryans, these, in, these ancient Indo-Europeans who were white with red hair, you know, invaded uh, the rest of the, these areas and kind of gave them their cultures. And some people will even go as far as to say that German is, is precedes Sanskrit, which is just outlandish. So you have all these people, right? And uh, like, for example, let me see, I, I'm, I'm literally like literally just doing research on this like this past yeah. week. So it's kind of fresh in my mind. But so you have all these scholars from the 30s up until even like the 70s who are, who are going out there to like find archaeological evidence for this. And um, one of the people who did this was the Nazis. So the Nazis were fascinated with this idea of Indo-Europeans, and, and they were fascinated with this idea of, a, of an ancient culture that was like, you know, superior. Because in the Vedas and in, and in Tibetan legends, you know, we hear about Shambhala. So we're told about Shambhala. Like and, a magical and these, place, right? Shambhala yeah. is like a magical place, yeah. Shambhala was just like this magical place, which again was like misunderstood by Western scholars. Um, so during this whole time period, there's just like a huge like peak interest from the Westerners, from the Westerners in Europe uh, in, into India and Tibet about this like strange lost civilization known as the Indo-Europeans and Shambhala and the Sanskrit languages and the Vedas and all this stuff. So they're trying to like find all this stuff. So the Nazis, they, they decided to uh, identify themselves with the Aryan race, which is not a European concept. The Aryan race, again, comes from the Vedas, comes from an, an ancient Hindu tale which apparently in academia started with these Indo-European people. So the Nazis identified themselves with the Aryans and said that, you know, their ancestors were the Aryans talked about in the Vedas who invaded uh, India and gave them culture. So it's this whole twisting of, of right. legend and myth and, and archaeological evidence. And so how does that tie like to now people going to church and reading the Bible and, oh, man. you know, being like trying to push that onto other people, which I get a lot. I get a lot of people that are like, oh, you know, you got to go to church and you got to follow this one deep down inside. I know it's bullshit, you know, not that. Let me make a disclaimer. I'm not saying that religion is bad because if you follow religion and it, it helps you do, make great decisions and helps you become a better person, then go for it. It's no different than somebody who works out every single day for their health. Versus somebody who only works out, let's say, once a week. If working out yeah, every yeah. single day helps you and it makes you super healthy, go for it. I'm not going to diss you for that. But don't shove like your doctrines down my throat because I don't follow it or because I have a sense that it's not fucking real. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So religion, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure exactly how that would tie into like the Nazis and stuff because the Nazis were all into like the occult, you know? They were into the occult, into like Atlantean theories and stuff like that. <clears throat> but speaking well, on. But doesn't like Satanism kind of branch off of religion? Because Satanism is a result of these creative religions. Like if we're talking about Lucifer not really being a person, it's really more of an identifier. But then yeah. it becomes this person that that a per someone created and then everybody starts following this thing and then they create their own, they have, you know, Alistair Crowley and Anton LaVey and they create the black Bible, which I wound up stealing from a Barnes and Noble. And, and yeah. you know, um, <laughs> like it's connected to religion, you know, it's, it, or it spawns yeah. off of religion, branches off religion. Can, is there any connection that you can make off of that or talk yeah. about that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. So, and just to speak on what you just said, like, yeah, I totally agree, man. Like, as far as like just normal people who are just seeking a better life, you know, mentally and spiritually who are going to church, you know, more power to them, man. But uh, that's just not for me anymore. You know, there's there's way more to look into, you know, and, and I always feel like people like us who actually dive deep into the history of the Bible, dive deep into the history of religion itself and the institutions that profess to be the holders of this knowledge. That's the best thing you can do 
as a Christian or as a Muslim or as a, a Jew, whatever mainstream religion that you adhere to, the best thing I think you can do for your soul and, and the connection with your God is to not just follow blindly, but actually set out on your own personal path to look deep into the history of what it is you are being taught. Because in my personal experience, when I did that, I my, my connection with the creator, the creative source has only strengthened, you know, but going to religion. Uh, yeah, I mean, the Nazis, the Aryan, the Aryans and all that stuff, how it ties into religion is it's it started to fortify the occult. And when these powers that be, specifically speaking, the Nazis at that time, they started to formulate what is known actually as the Luciferian doctrine. And um, for example, so I'm going to, I'm taking a look at some of these notes I have here. Yeah, go ahead, man. Um, I'm writing stuff down as you talk things that I'm like, Oh man, you know? Yeah. So, so like the that. Nazis and, and all these other Westerners that were, were trying to find Shambhala and the Aryan origins were fascinated with, with literature that was coming out during that time period. For example, we have the famous um, theosophical pioneer uh, Blavatsky, right? That dude. Or <laughs> well, that woman. Yeah. It's a lady. No, yeah, yeah. Me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, yes, you're just saying. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, Helena Blavatsky, right? Yeah. She was one of the, the founders of the Theosophical Society. Um, for those who don't know what that is, is basically like the or one of the or originators of the New Age movement back in the 1800s. You know, she claimed to like be in, in con contact, spiritual contact with these uh, ascended masters from Tibet. You know, in, in the today's age, within the occult and the new age movement, and even like the spiritual movements, we, you hear this term a lot, like ascended masters, and and you see people doing seances and con, you know connecting with these higher realm beings, and that all kind of came from Blavatsky and Theosophy. So, and Blavatsky, I believe, was a Russian born, and she was a, yeah, she was Russian, and so she's writing all this literature and all this like fascinating new age spiritual stuff, and. And so this starts influencing the art world, the literary world, and, and it starts influencing the political world. So with Blavatsky and also um, another uh, work of literature that greatly influenced Europe at that time was a book by the name of Darkness Over Tibet. I just read that book recently, like a couple of weeks ago. And honestly, like it changed my life a little bit just because it's to, to me, it's a profoundly symbolic book novel the guy who wrote it was a, a german by the name of um theodore ilion and uh he, cl he claims that it's a true story he, he tells he's telling a story of him trekking through tibet trying to find gurus and gain wisdom and he actually encounters this, this secret society that lives underground who they're cannibals and like they're they worship lucifer and all this craziness so it's supposed to be a real tale i don't think it is simply because it's just it's too profound like it's everything's just so symbolic and perfect like literally speaking right it's just a, it's a dope book <clears throat> but he, he published this in, in the late 1930s so blavatsky was in the late 1800s and then you have literature like like theodore ilion's coming out in the 30s and there's other things too coming out about tibet and shambhala and all this stuff and some of that starts to creep into to the nazis and the nazis themselves had a an office dedicated to um archaeological discoveries known as the Ananerb. so there was an office within the nazi party known as the Ananerb, and their job was to go out and find archaeological evidence to justify and support the aryan theory that there was a germanic ancestry that was really the root race for the other indo indo-european races such as india and, and russia and whatever so the nazis were fascinated with this stuff that was coming out so their connection to all of this is that is the occult is the luciferian doctrine it's just the superior atlantean race stuff and um out of all of that came the emerald tablets of toth and for those who aren't familiar with that, the Emerald Tablets of Toth 
have incalculably influenced the esoteric community in so many ways. For example, I'm sure you know who uh, Billy Carson is. Yes, I like Billy right? Carson. Yeah. yeah, everybody, who doesn't, right? Billy Carson, Forbidden Knowledge, all that stuff, Gaia TV, Ancient Aliens, right. he's everywhere. And his most famous book is the Compendium of the Emerald Tablets, right? And so... But the Emerald Tablets that taught the Atlantean as we know them and as we love them were actually given to us by an American occultist by the name of Dr. M. Doriel. And he wrote them, he published them in the late 1930s, again, amidst this whole frenzy of Tibet and Shambhala and ascended masters and the Aryan race and the Indo-Europeans, all this stuff. And again, he, like most of these other people, claimed to have spent eight years in Tibet uh, among these ascended masters who gave him the emerald tablets who were liter- which were <clears throat> literary literally um, emerald tablets and he he was given permission to translate them into English and what the re- the result of that was the famous emerald tablets of taught the Atlantean that we all know which Billy Carson um, has made a book on and so all of this is coming out of this era the 1930s, the 40s, the 50s. And so all of that connects to the occult. And then uh, here we are today, you know, with with the esoteric community, the occult community, which is kind of playing on the left-hand path, as they call it, which is, um, you know, sovereignty through knowledge as opposed to sovereignty through being saved. Right, right. Yeah, because you you bring up, uh, like, the Nazis and and going on this like archaeological like journey and it brings up even though it's a fictional movie but these producers know what they're doing so you talk about indiana jones and they and you see the nazis doing the same thing there and even though indiana jones you know the name indiana indian you know Mm, that's all connected i mean it's not they're they're like they're like fucking with us. They're throwing it in our faces, <laughs> and then I let it, you know. And we're not picking up on these sorts of things. Plus, you also mentioned like how they, you know, were uh, particularly like you know the Nazis, like Hitler. He was trying to find uh, deities and gods to help him, and Crowley was able to connect with this deity called Lamb. I don't know if you ever heard of it, L A M. Oh, yeah. And when he drew it, it looks like an alien gray. So there's that connection to like the U- UFOs and yeah, and that yeah. can can you talk anything about that? Is there like a connection between religion and this thing that's going on now, where you know the U.S. government's now admitting that there's things in the air that they can't, you know, don't know what they are, you know, like UFOs. Yeah, yeah I have. I'll, I also have a documentary on my uh, YouTube channel uh, where I get into the occult, UFOs, and psychology, and. Yeah, dude. So, so Crowley was obviously huge in the occult, you know, just, just a, a pioneer in, in that. And everybody has mixed views on him. Some people, you know, dislike him. Some people like him. I'm indifferent, you know, obviously, like as a researcher, I just, I just focus on the result of people's works and how that result, those results impacted the world. And Right. You just remain neutral. Today. You're neutral. You're neutral. Exactly. <clears throat> yeah. So Crowley, like you just mentioned, one of the most fascinating things about his work um, was that he contacted this being by the name of Lamb that dicti- dictated um, the book of the law to him. And as he, he later on drew this being, and it looks almost exactly like a gray alien, um, the only difference is, is the eyes look a little right. more human. But, uh, but yeah, he drew this prior to there being any mainstream image of the gray alien, or any, even then any reports of UFOs. So this being dictated the book of the law to him. And I don't know if you've read it, um, but uh, I have. And it's just a a wild thing, you know, to, okay, either one or two things, either it was dictated to him by this being, which is just crazy if it was, or two, he just, it came from his own imagination. And even if it did, he did some pretty heavy intuitive prophesizing because what that book is about is about the coming of a new age which in the book is known as Crowleyanity. And is this, yeah. And so this being lamb is, is like aggressively prophesizing through Crowley about its age that it wants to um, usher in, which is going to be, and, and it's crazy when you read it, at least for me, it's almost like we're living in that age. It talks about, 
you know, everybody <clears throat> being a star and how its followers, Lamb's followers will be known as stars and, you know, like stars, Hollywood, Hollywood right. stars. And so just all this stuff and how like, yeah, it's just it talks about basically what it's talking about. It's gonna it's an era of moral subject uh, subjectivity. I believe that's the term. Yes. Right. Right. Where, where there's no f- fine lines of of morality. Everything's just fluid. That's basically what it's saying. Is there's gonna be an, its age will be the age of anything goes. Anything goes right, and, and that's man, what we're living in now. Right. If we're right. not, so. Um, Crowley, man. Yeah. So he writes his book. He has this experience. And then him, what ties him to the UFOs even more so is the work that he did with Alan, uh, Alan Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard. Yep. So for those of you who don't know, yeah, L. Ron Hubbard, right, the father of Scientology, uh, and Jack Parsons, who was actually a pioneer in, in just jet propulsion technology. So like with he pioneered the science behind how jets work and, and rockets and stuff like that. So he had a huge part to play in NASA <clears throat> and, and world rocket ship in general. And he was an occultist as well. So him, L. Ron Hubbard, and Crowley were all friends and what about associates. Von Braun? Uh, I know he was, Von Braun? Yeah, I know he was a part of that too. Yeah, there's no, as far as I know, no connections with those guys. But of course, he was a Nazi. He was he was a high ranking Nazi official right. who was assimilated into our government through Project Paperclip, yep. who worked closely with Walt Disney. He worked closely with Walt Disney in creating a lot of those, you know, weird like educational videos that they used to do. But he later on renounced his work and 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 actually apparently told his assistant, um, Dr. Carol Rosin, about the coming fake alien invasion. So. Uh, but she's still so, alive. Yeah, she still talks. Yeah, about I hope yeah. so. I was thinking about it the other day. Yeah. Uh, um, but yeah, so so Hubbard, Parsons, and Crowley, they got together towards the end of Crowley's life, and they did some crazy ritual known as the Babylon working or the Amalantra working, and they were attempting to contact um, the whore of ba- Babylon from the book of revelation. They wanted to contact that being and usher it into our realm. Just crazy, not like crazy stuff. And apparently they, they were successful in the experiment and opened up a portal. And uh, so during this whole time period, of course we had the Roswell incident and then all this craziness, man. So from like the 1930s and onward to the, to the sixties, you have all these like just, crazy experiments going on these occult experiments going on these contact with beings ufos the nazis and all this stuff going on so it was a very interesting time period for this world and for for humans in general and and uh yeah man so what are your thoughts on um like you said like in the 30s and the 40s you we have this roswell crash at the same time you know with the war world war ii with the nazis and all this stuff um do you think that ultimately they opened something and little by little, like this portal or these energies are getting stronger and stronger to the point where maybe in a few years from now, we're looking at a completely different world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Cause you know, you have to add cryptids in there because, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, you had like reportings of like Bigfoot type creatures way back in the days, but like now you have all these different cryptids. Now you have, many sightings of, of Bigfoot. Now you have dog man and part of that, all these other weird creatures that people are seeing now, you know, I'm, I don't think that they're a uh, coincidence. I think they're all connected in some way. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, where I was going to go with that, I just remembered. Yeah. So in my documentary, and this is something that I've recently kind of concluded for myself after, you know, looking into this, um, I kind of side with like Carl Jung and, and uh, Jacques Vallée, you yeah. know, who's also a world renowned ufologist. And that a lot of this stuff is like, it's uh, interdimensional, but it's also subconscious for, so I, th- I think like magic and psychology are sisters of the same science. And, and in some, in some cases are, practicing the same exact thing, but just different terminology. So for us to like contact these beings, 
what we're really doing is we're reaching into the depths of the collective subconscious and we're calling these things from the collective subconscious into this reality, into this realm. And I think and in some cases, these beings are trying to get us to do that. And I think that quantum physics also fits in with this as well, because whatever, excuse me, whatever it is that we're, whatever it is that we're living in, you know, this, this realm, this dimension, this universe, it's, it's, it seems like it's an illusion. Like we're not really seeing all of the picture and that it's somewhat impenetrable by these other beings, unless there's some sort of cooperation by us. So kind of like vampires, like they're calling for us to allow them in. They can't come in unless we give them permission to come in or we we create the path for them to come in. And then I think maybe when, once they're in our realm, they maybe can't stay very long unless we keep giving them that power. And then ultimately they can stay forever. Is that like, am I on the right path or am I bugging out? No, no, <laughs> yeah, no, you're on the right path, man. I saw so because, for example, Carl Jung, right, the famous psychologist, he wrote a book on UFOs, his take on UFOs. And he basically concluded that, like, whatever it is that's going on, it's, it's happening in this collective sub- subconscious realm where we as humans, we have the power to collectively alter reality. And Jacques Vallée, he also kind of was in line with that. And he believed that whatever these beings are, you know, they're trying to almost trick us and create a mythology of themselves in our minds so that we can allow them to enter into our, our reality, into our spectrum of perception. So through and magic does the same thing, right? Dark occult magic does the same thing. You, you're setting up certain arbitrary sciences with the minerals you use, with the sigils that you use, with the incantations that you use, which is all vibration, right? It's all rudimentary science. So you're enter it you're trying to penetrate into these other realms these other ex- levels of existence and call in these beings and quantum physics does the same exact thing for example over at cern they're always trying to poke into black holes into you know dark matter into other dimensions they're doing the same thing they're trying to get out of this realm and into these other levels of, of existence to contact something and bring it here so nice. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, I, I've heard, <clears throat> I don't know if it's true, but rumors that they're the Hadron Collider, that they're smashing atoms and that some of the scientists are seeing like these evil faces manifesting. And they say this almost looks, quote unquote, demonic. <clears throat> mm-hmm. so, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, yeah. I mean, I haven't heard that one, but I mean, I wouldn't doubt it. I wouldn't doubt it, man. And uh yeah, dude. I mean, that's. I, I also have a documentary on, on Project Gateway where I kind of uh, just go into the CIA document that was declassified in 2003, which is all about like these other realms and how we can access them. We have the power to access them through astral projection and, and, and lucid dreaming and just vibratory meditational practices of linking both of our brains, hemispheres together right. and all this stuff. And in that document, they pretty much admit that like all of this stuff is real, you know, extra dimensional beings do exist, low vibrational entities do exist. And we do have the power to astral project and enter these other realms. And the realm that we're living in is actually like a very basic simulation where it's like a school, you know, where we're being schooled right now. We're being tested, you know, more or less. Is it like a matrix, like a matrix sort of a thing? Yeah, pretty much, man. I mean, even that has been pretty much concluded in the documentary. I, I get into uh, James Gates, who is a famous, um, you know, particle physicist who has stated, you know, in his research, when he's looking at things on a quantum level, he just keeps running into what he states as supercomputer codes. I mean, there are supercomputer codes written into the very fabric of our reality, binary code. And That makes sense to me. It's not, I mean, it's not like we're in a video game or something, you know what I mean? But it's like, that's how nature works. Nature runs off fractal patterns. Everything's a fractalized pattern. It's just the big question is, you know, who made it, you know? Right. Like who created that whole thing? Yeah. Yeah, And you're speaking of like binary code. There's um, the famous UFO uh, incident in the UK 
Um, I don't know if you know what it is. Uh, it's the there's a there was a uh, Air Force base out in the UK, and I don't I can't think. I know one of the guys was Jeff Burrows, and it was him and a bunch of other people that saw like lights out there, right? And so they uh, go to their their superior, their flight chief or whoever, and they tell them, look, you know, there's these lights out there. He doesn't believe them. So literally, like, I think it's on Christmas. This happened like in the 70s. It's either on Christmas or the day before Christmas. He's at a party and they come up to him and say, yeah, these lights showed up again. And he goes out there with the crew and they have like these um, they, this, these uh, equipment to, to monitor radioactivity and everything. And they start seeing these lights. And uh, one of the troops winds up going to like this part of the forest and he sees this triangle of craft sitting there and he winds up touching it. So what winds up happening is like he believes that the craft lifts up and takes off. What he doesn't realize is that he loses time. So he finds out like somewhere down the line, days later, or weeks later, he starts writing down binary code. Because that's what that whatever craft gave to him gave him that binary code and when they uh started breaking down the cipher of it it led him to a location called high brazil and high brazil if you look that up is supposedly where atlantis was at so all these different things like are they connect even though they're like like it's stories that you may not have heard and then, you know, I tell you or stories that you tell me that I haven't heard. And then there's always like some sort of connection to it when you think yeah. about, it, you know, and I, I, yeah. I just don't think that anything's really a coincidence. I think we do live yeah. in a matrix. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So seemingly like if we look at all of it from the bigger picture, it's like every ancient culture is pretty much saying the same thing is that there used to be, you know, this Atlantean period of time where we were more advanced and, you know, we were among the quote unquote gods and then a cataclysm occurred. And after the cataclysm, um, only few of us survived and some of the secrets were hidden away and some of them were inscribed in certain places for us to find afterward, to be given direction, <clears throat> to restart civilization. And then from then on, there was manipulation by the priesthoods over that knowledge and then slowly our past was deliberately hidden from us from these priesthoods. They, they continued the worship, they continued the work and the knowledge, but it was all hidden and masked by modern day institutional religion. And um, so that's why we see all these similarities around the world with, with structures and knowledge and myths and legends. But that's just our history here on Earth. You know, I mean, we have other beings and entities uh, that exist outside of this Earth and realm, you know, who, who are kind of peering into here and also manipulating that vulnerability as well. The vulnerability of us losing connection with our past and who we really are. I mean, for some people, like for example, you take a, a kid right? Just running around eight or nine years old. I mean, man, they, they really have no idea what's really going on out here. It takes decades, you know, it takes decades to, to barely start to wake up, even if that, you know, and, and but for some people, it's too late. You know, for some people, it's like they're in the last years of their life and they're barely starting to realize like, oh, man, we've been duped, you know, but right now we're having a mass awakening and people are really starting to realize that there's so much more to our history, archaeologically, historically, spiritually. Um, so we're starting to rebuild that connection. And I think people are, are kind of thirsting for that and really starting to take their power back. So what, what have you had any like experiences like uh, UFOs or anything, you know, weird? Cause I, I figure you, you're doing all this research. You have to be thinking about things. And when you think about things, I think you bring things to you because I know I have, yeah. a, I have years of experience. I would love to hear it, man. I always love hearing like UFO stories and stuff for me, sadly, I guess, you know, uh, I don't have any UFO stories per se. I mean, I've seen weird things up in the sky, like little, but I have nothing that was like fascinating. Like, damn, that was a UFO. Like me and the homies, we used to kick back and, and, uh, just go night watching sometimes <clears throat> and, and we'd see some weird stuff we'd see some stuff that was like flashes like weird flashes things moving way too fast 
you know, but as a never like something that I can actually say like, yo, that was a UFO. Um, but my, my experiences have mostly been paranormal actually. Most of my experiences. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just weird stuff, man. Like just, for example, I had this one experience, um, when I was in early high school with two other friends where, uh, I don't even know what to call it, but it was, it was like a, like a skinwalker. I mean, we call, we called it a skinwalker. Whoa. But no, but it wasn't actually a skinwalker. Like, uh, but well, just explain it. I'll, and I'll, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what basically what happened is, is we we're hanging out, you know, smoking some, some cannabis and, and whatever, in some forest spot that we used to hang out and we left that spot. And then we went like 15 minutes in the opposite direction, which we had not touched at all that day. And as we're walking down that trail, I see to the right of us an iPod and a bag of weed sitting there. So I jump forward before my friends can grab it. Like, yo, there's an iPod and a bag of weed. And <laughs> so we're, we're like jumping up and down of excitement. And then come to find out it was my friends, you know, who I'm with right then and there, his iPod and bag of weed, which was in his pocket was, we were just smoking it and listening to his iPod, like, you know, 20 minutes in the opposite direction so it was a glitch that's what you would call it it was a glitch in time type thing oh wow I, that, no i bring up the, <laughs> the skinwalker thing because at that time in our life we had just learned about skinwalkers so like we used to just blame everything on skinwalkers we'd be like oh man it was the skinwalkers <laughs> so we just ran out of there right but i'm being straight up man like that that really did occur right. uh i don't know what to think about it I sometimes call my friend to this day and I'm like, dude, please like, tell me the truth. Like, did you prank me or what? And he's just like, no, dude, like you were right there with me. Like I, you know, so I don't know, man, I don't know what to make of it. It was a glitch. And uh, that's actually when I, when I sit and think about that one, that one's crazier than anything else I've experienced because right. if that was real, if that was a really a glitch, like that's just that just totally proves that the, we're living in some weird matrix thing, you know, right. but I've had like other weird, like ghostly type things happen. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like, like I had some astral projection experiences throughout my life. I just dropped a video actually talking about that. Uh, I've, ex I've astral projected twice, both involuntarily. The first time I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what was happening. It was, it was pretty, harmless i was just i just kept getting up from my bed and like falling to the floor but what made it interesting is that happened the same night after i had first read the emerald tablets of Toth, the atlantic <laughs> oh, talks about that yeah i was like 13 years old reading the emerald tablets and and i remember it had a huge impact on me man like it's to this day when i sit there and read it like I mean, it's whatever M, dr m dorial did man like it, whether that was truly from tibet and from toth or not like that book just has power man for sure right. it's powerful and then the second astral projection experience i had was years later when i was like 16 and then this one was actually weird i actually encountered like this energetic entity it didn't have any like actual form it was just energy just darkness but uh in the emerald tablets of toth the toth teaches you how to expel these deities how to use your life force your light force and and expel them so i felt like it was almost a training experience because i got right. to actually use that <clears throat> and did and i expelled this being from from my astral um state but uh yeah those are just a couple man to to briefly mention yeah i battle shadow people all the time <laughs> that's like my whole life bro like battling yeah. shadow people man i see ufos like almost on the daily man yeah like actual yeah. craft or like objects craft. objects craft lights tell me the craziest craft story you have or one of them at least one of them okay so um i got interviewed for the show uh the confessionals with tony merkel yeah. if you go on there i think it's like maybe three 15 the show number 315 look up secrets of area two right because okay. that's yeah, because you were in the military right you said I was in the military i was in yeah, so, okay station at nellis and uh yep. and so I'm a, I'm a brand new guy like like what they call a slick sleeve i didn't even have a rank like on my on my shoulder and uh we're working in this spot called area two and area two is uh what they call a wsa weapon storage area and now it's not a big deal to talk about it but back then i couldn't but we had nukes there at that place and we had missiles and other stuff so that's what we were guarding i was yeah. i was a cop <clears throat> yeah. so i'm guarding that area 
and I'm brand new and I'm in a truck with a, a, a partner of mine, he's he outranks me because they never want to put two people that are lower ranked together, especially somebody who's brand new. They want to they want the the older person to, you know, teach the new person how to do the the ins and outs of, of every day. So every patrol had at least one or two people that were higher ranking. So the person that was with me was like, I think, an airman in first class. And after that, you become a senior airman. And so I was just a basic airman. So it's me and this one guy. We're in the truck and we go, we meet with this other patrol. I don't want to get into it. If you listen to the episode, it's free. You can listen to it. But yeah, we meet yeah. up with another patrol and we're just talking shit. And it's about maybe 20 minutes before we're supposed to get relieved to go home. And we're on the back side of the weapon storage area. And the back side of the weapon storage area is nothing but desert. Now, granted, we're separated by three types of fencing. And the fencing is highly, like, secure. Uh, the middle fence is electric. And then the two out, the outer fence and the inner fence is all hooked up with cameras, all types of, of stuff to de detect if anything is near it. Because it's sensitive stuff. You know, we're talking about nukes, right? And, yeah. and other weapons and other stuff. So we're there hanging out, talking, and all of a sudden, the series of triangular lights pop up. Now, nobody's supposed to be out there in that desert, not civilians, not even other military, unless they let us know ahead of time that they're going to be out there doing whatever exercises or whatever. Yeah. But at that time of night, that never would ever happen, meaning like an exercise or anybody would be out there doing anything at night where there's no light, you know? So uh, my partner calls it in and it creates this hoopla. They don't let anybody go home. They send teams out there to investigate. And when I mean teams, like me, when I first got in, I was only certified on the M16A2. And so I was only allowed to carry that weapon. Later on, I certified on other weapons, but it was me and this other guy. All, we, all we're carrying is like assault rifles. That's it. And the other team that we met up with to talk, same thing. But the team they send out there was a guy with an M240 saw gun, M60, M203 that's attached to the M, uh, M16A2. You had the flight chief out there. You had an officer that was out there. They bring us back, right, into their offices, have yeah. us fill out this memo. We fill out the memo. They bring us in together you know, as a group to talk about it. Then they bring us in separately to make sure we're telling the same story. Yeah. Then they told us it never happened. Don't talk about it. The next day they told the whole flight, like the whole group that, that, that day that worked, don't yeah. talk about it. And we never like, we never really talked about it, but that was a crazy incident because it's Thank not God. something that was conventional. It wasn't a helicopter because it yeah. made no noise. Okay. And whatever it was, you couldn't see the shape of it, but I can see that it was a mass because it was blocking the stars that were behind yeah. it. So something was there and it didn't move. Like it wasn't moving. It just the just lights hovering. was hovering. And then it just, boom, it was gone. That's wild, dude. Okay. <clears throat> That's wild. Yeah, yeah. And then you got all this stuff with disclosure happening now, you know. And, you know, of course, the conspiracy community is kind of nervous thinking that they're getting ready for project blue beam, right. In the fake alien invasion. Right. You know, but, uh, yeah, yeah, that's wild. And it all ties in, it all ties in. And man, well, the thing wild. is like, you, you've been, you know, you've been studying this stuff. Uh, and the, like, from what I understand from listening to you and not just you, just other people, it's like nothing is separated even though you guys do essentially study different parts of things, yeah, everything yeah. essentially is connected. Like paranormal to me is not just ghosts and spirits. When people talk paranormal to me, that's the umbrella and everything, cryptids, UFOs, ghosts, angels, demons, and, and whatever, all fall under that umbrella. And everything's all connected because if you hear stories about people that have run into like a, a, a creature, like a Bigfoot, yeah. Then they'll say that they see an orb or a craft later or vice versa. Yeah. They'll see a UFO and then they'll see a Bigfoot or a creature or, or, you know, people that have seen Loch Ness have also seen craft come out of the, of, of the lock, like USOs come out. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, 
days later or hours later. So to me, it's like everything's pretty much all connected. But what is it? That's the problem. That's the question. Yeah. What is all this? What are we living in? Yeah. And like you said, it's a t- it's a test. We're living in a realm where we're being tested. And uh, I-, I don't know. I think we're end times. We're in it. Mm. We're in the end times right now. Yeah, man. And if we take a look at like where this ties in with like religion and all this stuff, it's like no matter what it is, politics, religion, education, the medical field, all the institutions are trying to control the narrative of what this is and how to go about it. And it's interesting how like we talk about like the one world government and everything being this this one global thing. And I think it all started kind of with religion in, in a sense because for example judaism which which holds a huge grip of the people's minds also through christianity and all of its denominations judaism was was the official you know institution of monotheism but as we now know the judaic culture it's its stories its mythologies its doctrines were based on the old world mythologies the canaanite mythologies the sumerian mythologies in which they were polytheistic you know all for example this all those the stories in genesis are almost borrowed renditions from the sumerian tales where it wasn't one god but it was two gods you know the brother gods enki and enlil and in some cases some of their sisters and some of their other brothers so with judaism we start to see the actual formation of this one hive mind thing and uh and they're starting to do do away with the ancient cultures, start to do away with the ancient knowledge and, and the esotericness of it all and just kind of just simplify it. So it's all being simplified. It's all being dumbed down. It's all being pushed towards this narrative of don't look into the past. Don't question anything. It's all good. It's all taken care right. of. You know, and the last card, as Dr. You know, Werner von Braun said, or as Carol Rosen claims, the last card is going to be that fake alien invasion that's going to push it all into connection. It's going to make it all click. Yeah, it's kind of like that meme where you see that that cartoon of this of the dog drinking like coffee and there's fire all around them. And he, he says it's fine. You know, yeah. like everything's yeah. fine, you know, and uh, and and I I came from. um an education like background, meaning like I recently like stopped working for the education field out here in central Florida. Dude, they're not teaching these kids the right things, bro. It's so fucked up, bro. It is so fucked up, man. And that's where you get them. You get them as kids, man, like fresh out the womb, you get them, bro. That's how you get them. And yeah, learning fucked up things right now, man. Yeah, I think that's actually one of the things that helped me in my life too. Is I was I've always been rebellious. I was never a good student, man. Me too, bro. <laughs> me too, brother. I used yeah. to cut school all the time, man. Seriously, dude. Um, well, I mean, if you take things simply, like Thanksgiving, like what's really Thanksgiving about? Like, really, it's not about people getting together and having food. It's you know these people from the 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 fucking across the pond coming over and killing indigenous people for their land and 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 things you know people uh celebrate saint patrick's day oh saint patrick yeah he went and he killed all these snakes no it was about a genocide you know but people celebrate hey let's drink beer to to genocide green beer you know they don't know all these things and even like you know this like jesus christ he wasn't born in the during the winter solstice, quote unquote. If he was real, if he was real, he wasn't born during the winter solstice. But yeah, we yeah. still celebrate his birthday uh, during Christmas time, and he's not a white dude with blonde hair. If anything, he's an Arabic dude with dark skin. You know, yeah. probably probably dreadlocks, man. I mean, yeah. shit, you know, like it's it's all fucked up and dis- discombobulated, and people eat that shit up, bro. Like, man. Yeah. For real, dude. It's like, that's why we got to do this work. And that's why I do the work that I do is, like you said, everybody plays their part, you know, in this truther community, which is, you know, the larger umbrella term. Everybody does their part. And uh, I started off with the political aggro aspect of it. And then, you know, I kind of moved from that. And my part to play now is is this esoteric history part, you know, like we got to make sure the history is correct and it's on point. Otherwise, it's going to be manipulated and the narrative is going to be told in a certain way and then it's just going to repeat itself, you know, but 
Yeah, man. So let me ask you a question. Like what you're doing, you're testing the waters right now. Have you felt any backlash? Have you felt any anything weird, like anybody like trying to maybe stop you from doing what you're doing? Not yet. Okay. You know, not yet. But like, yeah, no. Not really. Honestly, I've had the opposite experience. Like everybody's just rooting for me, you know, giving me some love, you know. Right. But um, I'll probably eventually, you know, eventually I probably will uh, meet with some real, real repercussion but i hope not but i, I feel like <laughs> you're, you're gonna hit a nerve oh yeah you're gonna hit a nerve man if you haven't already you know and and you're yeah. on a list already like i'm on the list <laughs> on the list oh yeah just, for sure just for doing this. List, dude. <laughs> yeah. i mean the, the stuff that i used to say like i said i used to have a brand name called kill gov right you know i have it yeah. tattooed on my hand on my finger right, right. You know, so like that's actually one of the reasons I moved away from the like the political stuff of it. I still research politics every day. I right. still try to stay in tune with that. But I moved away from it because I realized I was making an impact and I was influencing my peers and specifically the people younger than me. And I was like, I don't know if I want to lead them down that war path, you know. Right. So I, I kind of changed gears and I wanted like I just want to lead with education, with enlightenment, you know, enlightening people's education and their minds towards uh, being sovereign. That's really what I'm, I'm most important. What's most important to me is, is teaching people how to be sovereign. And we can't be sovereign if we're institutionalized. No, if you're trapped, you can't do anything. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So before we end this, if you had to give advice to people, uh, what books or where, what sites or where should they go to get information to kind of lead them down I don't want I don't want to say the the better path, but just some sort of path to the truth. Yeah, absolutely. Um, two books that I started with that right. really changed my life and got me set onto this. I'll say three books. And uh, first is uh, William Bromley's The Gods of Eden. It's a good little brief book that, that just kind of touches on all the stuff we just talked about. Right. William, William Bromley, The Gods of Eden. Another one would, of course, be David Icke's. Uh, oh, David Icke. Yeah, yeah. It was not Children of the, Children of the Matrix. It was a dope one. I, was, I think that was one of his first. Tales from the Time Loop. There we go. That's the one that I read when I was in high school. David Icke, Tales from the Time Loop. Okay. He does a fascinating job of like getting political. You know, That's what I really like about his work. He, he knows who's who. He can give you names. He can give you dates. That's what I'm going to try. I'm, I'm going to try. I'm going to try to reach out to him to get him. But yeah. yeah. What else? Yeah. What's the third book? The third one. Uh, damn. What was it? Oh yeah. This one's uh, nothing or no something in this book is true by Bob Frisell. F R I S S E L L. F R I. F R I S S. E L L, I believe. Okay. If you, it should show up, Bob Fussell. Something in this book is true. He's got one called "Nothing in This Book Is True." Also, so okay. Um, I but got you. Just for starters, man. Like I, those right. books were one of the first few books that I read back in high school. That like. And what's really the name of your first stuff. book? My Shut first up. book. Yeah, your first book. So I can get my, people to get on your your stuff, man. Uh, my <laughs> first book. It, it's it's not um, available right now. Is but it's titled "It's the Anunnaki Theorem." I'm actually rewriting that one to be released later this year with updated information and having it professionally edited. Uh, but my second book, which is the book that everybody knows me by now, is yeah. uh, The Lucifer Mystery Revealed. Okay, that's the one too. And uh, I just released a documentary version of it on YouTube. So if you want to check out the documentary first or whatever, it's up there for y'all. Okay, so I, I kind of wanted to end this, but I can't help it. You brought up Anunnaki. And I'm yeah, very yeah. interested in the Anunnaki. And you have in individuals like um, Zachariah Sitchin, but people are starting to turn on him now, saying yeah. that his, his interpretations were wrong. Now, what's your knowledge of the Anunnaki? Man, that was one of the first subjects that I was obsessed with yes. you know, back in high school. And still am. I still love the subject. Highly respect Sitchin's work. However, more recently, I've been starting to see you know, what these critics are saying about him you know 
So, I mean, I always had my, crit my critiques about him just because I read his books. I've read almost all of them. So I, there were little things, little nuanced things that I would pick up about him and his research style that I didn't like. Like, for example, like there were some tablets that he just he would he wouldn't reference, you know, like he, there's some things he just wouldn't reference. So, I'm so like, he'd mention them, but he'd just like leave it. Yeah, he just wouldn't, he, okay. he wouldn't reference it. And then uh, he would repeat himself a lot. You know, these are just little things that I picked up for myself. But uh, more recently, because I'm rewriting my, when I first dropped my Anunnaki theorem book back in 2018, I was still gung ho about him and his research and was kind of pushing the same, you know, repetitive narratives that everybody who's obsessed with him does. But I've since then taken a more critical look at what he's, at his work and kind of like researching what his, um, you know, uh, competitors are saying about him. And I'm starting to realize what they're saying. I'm starting to get, get it. So my viewpoint on him now is that he did kind of, um, I'll say, manipulate things to fit his narrative. But what I like about his work is that he did what nobody has ever done before him. And I think even after him, and he, he was able to take a look at all the world's major cultures in fine detail. I mean, like if you, you got to read his entire earth chronicles book before you can, before you can have an honest opinion on his work. Cause when you read those entire, those type, that was like seven or so books in those, in that series, man, he goes, into like insane detail about all these cultures and their mythologies and makes just fascinating connections. So what I love about his work is the speculativeness of it, how he was able to speculate on such a highly detailed level about this uh, supposed global race of beings by the name of the Anunnaki and how they influence all the world's cultures. So that's what's great about him. But there are some things that he did kind of manipulate to fit that narrative. But that's not to say that we won't find evidence in the future that will prove him right in his intuition, because we have not even come even close to deciphering all the Sumerian tablets that are out there. Matter of fact, they're trying to stop us from doing that we've only right. been able to decipher the same ten thousand or fifteen thousand since we've discovered the hundreds of thousands from the 1800s okay and so what what is your view on the vatican because i i, I again rumors have it that the vatican has a library or almost like a stockpile of very important text documents fucking actual artifacts possibly an alien body you know that they're not releasing to anybody have you done any research on that or do you know anything about that i haven't gotten deep into it yet i would love to i'm i'm fascinated with the idea of the vatican library theory i mean they do have a theory, a, a library they do have a basement that's not fact and don't they, don't they also have a telescope named lucifer <laughs> i looked into that uh, uh apparently it's not actually named lucifer but it's like a sub acronym for it. <laughs> and but, they, but yeah. hopefully they see UFOs and things. And, but anyway, yeah, well, it's on Mount Graham here in the United States. I forgot what state, but it's, it's, I think it, it is, or if not like one of the largest telescopes in the world, which is like crazy. Like, what are they looking for? You know, but when it comes to the Vatican and all that, um, I would refer people to Mauro Biglino. If you've heard of him, Mauro Biglino, he's okay. he's made he was actually uh, an Italian translator who worked um, for a third party through the Vatican. So he actually used to work, I think, um, somewhere in South America as a translator through a third party for the Vatican. The Vatican would send his company and stuff documents and then they would translate them into modern languages. Uh, and apparently he realized that, you know, Sitchin was right and that the Vatican knew about the Sumerian origin of the Bible and all this stuff. So he's got a famous book um, out. I forgot what it's called, but Mauro Biglino, he's, he's, he's uh, used to work for the Vatican and claims, yeah, they know what's up. They know about the aliens and the Anunnaki and all that. Okay. That's dope, man. Have you done any exploration yourself? Have you gone anywhere to do any sort of exploration? Cause I saw a video, I think of you in Mexico, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. I was out there on vacation, but I tried to get, you know, some, some little clips and just some stuff out there while I was out there, but not yet, man. That's something that I, I would love to do, you know, and uh, I, hopefully eventually later on in my life, that will kind of be a part of my work right now. Unfortunately, I'm still trying to set up myself within the system to be sovereign. 
Uh, I'm getting there. I'm actually more sovereign than I was, you know, even just a few years ago. But yeah, that's the goal, man. The goal is to be completely sovereign so that, you know, we can wake up and do what we want when we want. So when I reach that level, I'm definitely hitting a few places, you know, like Ethiopia, Egypt, right. all kinds of places. Right. Because Ethiopia is supposedly the, um, what's that thing it's supposed to be in Ethiopia, the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah. Yep. 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 I got a documentary on that one too. <laughs> <laughs> so listen so as we end this dude let me know uh what you have what's what's in the future for esoteric eddie is it documentaries books you know you're gonna be on any any of the ancient aliens tv shows because i i can man. see you being on on something like that man that'd be kind of dope man that would be dope <laughs> uh not yet though I, i'm gonna try and make that happen for for the people man everybody wants to see me up there and a so I'll try to make that happen eventually. But as of right now, just the, the usual routine, man, just going to be dropping documentaries on YouTube every month. Um, and uh, on Instagram, I drop, you know, personal content. If you want to just keep up, keep up to date with other little things that I'm doing. But yeah, documentaries going to be dropping the Anunnaki theorem this year. And um, just keep it rocking, man. Documentaries and books and try to move up the levels to uh, eventually influence this world in bigger ways to help out. So how many documentaries do you have now? Do you think? Uh, somewhere, somewhere between, um, you know, 15 and 20. Right. I don't know exactly right now, but somewhere around then. Yeah. I'll so be I'll dropping a new one this, like this, this weekend. And then you have a book that you had out, but I guess you took it back and now you're rewriting it. And then you have a second book. So you're going to have two books. So are you yep. working on the third eventually? Yeah, third one. Uh, I've got a couple ideas on what I want it to be. Nothing set in stone yet. But yeah, yeah, I'll be steadily dropping books over the next you know few years. I'm not sure when I'll retire from that, but I love writing in general. So I want to get back to writing fiction also, actually. Right. I started writing fiction when I was a kid and all like kind of based on this stuff too. I would love to write fiction to also kind of influence people in a different way, you know? Cause it started with fiction for me. It was the fiction and then it led to the nonfiction. Right. That's usually how it is, man. So my yeah. dude, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate you coming on. You killed it. I mean, this is for sure one of my best episodes. Um, you know, hopefully I'm, I'm getting better and better at bringing <laughs> awesome guests on. And I hope that this can generate more, you know, traffic your way. Um, thank you. Yeah, thanks yeah. brother. I appreciate it, man. Hey, thank right? you. Stay uh stay safe, man. Absolutely. Okay, brother. Peace. Peace. Namaste, man.